It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Um, Mr. My, my question uh, to the Premier. Um, Premier, every day I worry about Ontario's growing debt and our anemic pace of economic growth and job creation, which has caused you to lower expectations on economic growth. I do sincerely hope that Thursday will be a turning point. We'll finally see the win Liberal plan to grow our economy get spinning under control. But I, I worry about your pension for kicking things down the road. Uh, in 10 months, you've launched 36 different panels. Wow. Um, your governing philosophy seems to be why put off till tomorrow what you can delay indefinitely by a panel today? Uh, let me ask you directly, Premier. Will fall, the fall economic statement of Thursday Question? contain any more panels that will kick this can down the road even further? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me just respond uh, to the uh, leader of the uh, opposition by asking him if his uh, party is going to support the uh, supporting small business act, Mr. Speaker, because we're trying to get that piece of legislation through, and that would actually. So my hope is, my hope is that we'll be able to get it through committee. My understanding is that uh, the the opposition needs to support us in getting that through committee and getting it back to the uh, back to the house. So in terms of the work that we've been doing, and I would. I would uh, say to them, the leader of the third party that he would remember that we have more than recovered all of the jobs that, uh, that were lost as a result of the economic downturn. We continue to work to invest in people and invest in uh, infrastructure and to create a business climate, including the Small Business Act, Mr. Speaker, that will allow business Thank to sir. thrive and will allow business to continue to hire and expand. That, I hope they will join Thank us you. in that work. Supplementary. I, uh, I don't think I got an answer to the Premier's question. She should ask me a question back, Speaker, and I'm glad to say that, um, yes, we did vote for that bill uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, Premier, so you might want to loop in with your House leader to get uh, uh, updated information. But let, let me um, get back to a more serious matter. Uh, your, your philosophy uh, continues to be to own tough decisions, to panels, to conversations and consultations. It's been now 10 months. And you say that you're for job creation, but, but Premier, not everybody can work for the government. We also need a healthy, thriving private sector. You've abandoned any attempt to try to control spending. Your wage freeze has been abandoned. Uh, you've not moved down fixing the broken arbitration system. Uh, Don Drummond has basically become a missing person in the province of Ontario when it comes to his report. Question. So here's my question. I worry that your only alternative, if you won't control spending, is to increase taxes. Will the fall economic statement contain a study, a panel, a consultation, anything that's going to increase taxes on hardworking Ontario families? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the, that the uh, party opposite supported the bill yesterday. They are now blocking it at committee, so it would be very helpful if they would move it, help us move it through committee, so that we could get that act in place, Mr. Speaker, so we could support small businesses. And in terms of in terms of what the member opposite will see in the fall economic statement, Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that Mayor, investing please. in people and investing in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, and investing in a business climate that will allow businesses to thrive, we believe is the way forward, Mr. Speaker. Now, the Leader of the Opposition would like to focus everything in our power on fighting the deficit. The trouble is, Mr. Speaker, if we do that, if we do not make the investments in business and in people and in infrastructure that are necessary, that at the end of the day, according to his plan, there will be nothing to fight for. We want to fight yes, for sir. jobs. We want to fight for growth, Mr. Speaker. And so we want to put the conditions in place so that that growth can happen. That's what we're doing. My hope is that he will join with us and help us to support that kind of growth. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, we're going to fight against the growing Liberal debt and fight for job creation and opportunity in Ontario men. I do that each and every day because, quite frankly, Speaker, somebody has to do it because you're not. All we've seen now are 36 studies. Uh, you've made no difficult decisions to actually control spending in the province of Ontario. Uh, we put forward 10 questions to the Finance Minister. I hope he'll take the time to respond to those questions, saying the name of Mr. Fidelli including the fact that you had counted in your plan on $6 billion in savings from a wage freeze that you threw under the bus when you became Premier. So where are you going to find those $6 billion? Let me ask you a direct question because I'm concerned about this. Um, I understand the Liberals are contemplating increasing education property taxes. They're going to try to do what is a very sneaky education property tax hike, either an economic study statement or study that further. Please tell me that that is not being considered by the Liberal government. You're not going to ask hardworking families already strapped 
to Thank increase you. their property taxes to pay for your overspending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the uh, I think the leader of the third party really want uh, the uh, the um, opposition. Sorry, <laughs> the leader of the opposition wants to have it both ways, Mr. Speaker. So on the one hand, he says. Don Drummond is not someone we paid attention to, which is just not true. 60 per cent of what Don Drummond uh, recommended we have paid attention to. And, Mr. Speaker, there are other issues that Don Drummond raised in his report that we have said, yeah, we have to look at those things. He can't have it both ways. Either we take the advice, we take the advice of, uh, of a well-respected economists like Don Drummond, which we have done and are doing, and we examine all of those issues, and we put those into our documentation to say, you know, these are things Things that we have to look at. We are interested in, in investing in people, investing in infrastructure and business climate, Mr. Speaker. What they want to do is slash and cut services to people. We are not going to do that. Thank we you. believe that the people of Ontario deserve better than that, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Your question? The member from Nipperson. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and good morning. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Leader, I think you got your answer about the new taxes, by the way. This week marks the fifth anniversary of Ontario becoming a have-not province. Yay! Let me remind you that when you took office, Premier, Ontario was a robust province and actually paid out equalization payments to those needy provinces. So far, your government has received nearly $10 billion dollars in equalization payments. Order. In those same five years, provincial revenue has increased by $17 billion. So between equalization payments and increased revenue, we're talking about tens of billions of extra dollars in extra question. cash. I have a simple question, Speaker. How is it that you're still running a deficit and can't balance a budget? Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, it's evident from the, the question that the member hasn't been reading the budgets year over year. Order. It's evident that the member opposite hasn't been looking at the tremendous and is not aware of a global recession that's hit yeah. the entire world, and he's not obviously paying attention to the effects it's having on all provinces and that of Canada. Ontario. Now, stop the clock for me. I have a list of about six names in my head, and I'll only use one for now, but I'll come back to you. Member from Renfrew, come to order. Carry on. Our priority has been clear throughout. We have been controlling our spending. We've been very disciplined in the way we're taking the measures necessary to respond to the recession. And it's working, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We're creating more jobs. We're cutting our spending. And Ontario and Ontarians are getting ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. You know, during the recession, the member from Leeds Grenville actually had hair. That's how long ago we're talking here, Speaker. Oh. <clears throat> let, me, let me tell you that Drummond, Don Drummond had some, uh, and I did that with his blessing, Speaker. Don Drummond had some serious recommendations. He called for a sharp degree of fiscal restraint, for a wrenching reduction from the path that spending is now on, and for you to act swiftly and boldly. But you didn't do any of that. Speak, uh, speaker, uh, spending continues. It's absolutely out of control. So how are you going to balance the budget by 2017-18? Your finance Question. minister says, quote, we'll grow the economy to get increased revenues. But the Bank of Canada only two e weeks ago said we will not meet our growth expectations this year or next. Thank you. So we failed on spending and Thank you. How are you planning to balance the budget? Minister Finance. And there's a dichotomy, Mr. Speaker. There's no leadership from that side. They feel, they feel that the austerity measures that we've taken, and we have taken many, to control and actually cut spending year over year. We're the only government in all of Canada to have achieved that, but we are also the government that's investing in its people. We're investing in infrastructure. We're making strategic investments to provide for more jobs and stimulate economic growth. They choose not to do that, and we will. We choose also to lower taxes for small business. They're holding that up, Mr. Speaker. I ask them, why are they holding up small businesses, 90 per cent of which will no longer pay this health tax, and holding up a committee? Stand up for the people of Ontario and our businesses, Mr. Speaker. 
Final supplementary. Well, I'll stand up for Ontario right now, Speaker, right behind my leader, Tim Hudak. We have some serious questions about your ability with numbers. You haven't made the tough decisions the Drummond report called for. Spending is not going down. And the Bank of Canada says we won't hit our growth targets, so revenues will not go up. As spending is not going down, it's not possible to balance the budget without the $6 billion planned savings from the wage freeze. And with revenues not going up, you're obviously planning further tax increases. We just heard one acknowledged to our leader a few minutes ago. Enough of this nonsense. Enough of the political spin. Come clean. Will you tell us how it's even remotely possible for you to balance the budget in 2018 with spending up and revenue Question. down? Mr. Finance. Mr. please. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I tell them to come clean. I ask them to come clean as well. Pass the bill to support small business, Mr. Speaker. That is what we're doing. That is creating jobs and that is stimulating growth. When it comes to some of the measures that we've taken to reduce spending, we've done it without their support, Mr. Speaker. They voted against the very issues that we're putting forward that Drummond recommended. And as a result, we've actually cut spending year over year. More importantly, to those watching on TV, there has been a number of austerity measures that's been taken right across Canada, more so than anywhere else right here in Ontario. We know that other parts of the world have had to suffer through their austerity measures because they haven't made the necessary investments in our yes, future, sir. in their future. We're doing both, Mr. Speaker, and now it's time for us to make those investments, to create those jobs, to stimulate that Thank growth, you. and to ensure that Ontarians Thank in the you. future have a better tomorrow. Yes. Stop the clock, please. I continue to be concerned about people that uh, continue to stand when I stand. The tradition and the convention is that you immediately sit down, your microphone's turned off anyway, and you're stealing my time. New, new question, the leader of the, in, the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Ontario families are more and more concerned about a government that seems less and less clear about their plans for Ontario's future. For months, the Premier insisted that new tolls and taxes that hit family budgets were the only way to pay for new transit. Then last week, she announced a different plan that involved floating bonds. Has the Premier ruled out new taxes and tolls that hit family budgets, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, what we are determined to do is to build, to continue to build transit across the province and particularly in the GTHA. We know, Mr. Speaker, that investment in infrastructure across the province, whether it's roads and bridges in, uh, in rural and northern communities, Mr. Speaker, whether it is transit in, uh, in our urban centres and in the GTHA, Mr. Speaker, all of that investment is necessary. It's necessary in the short term because it creates huge jobs opportunities but mr speaker in the long term it is what will drive the economic growth that is so necessary mr right. speaker if we do not have that infrastructure in place if we do not have those transit uh, projects in place then people's quality of life will continue to suffer mr speaker That's and right. businesses will not be able to move through the congested area areas so we are going to continue to build transit and we hope that the third party will support us mr speaker supplementary speaker a few short months ago the Premier made a splashy announcement uh, about a transit funding panel whose job was to study the studies on studies about new taxes and tolls. But now, before the panel has reported back, she's floated a totally different idea. Can the Premier tell us anything about her plan? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Contrary, obviously, to the belief of the leader of the third party, there are a number of things that we need to do in order to be able to continue to invest in infrastructure across the province. So the green bonds are one part of that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Anne Golden, who is uh, working with her team to put out a report by mid-December that will give us some advice on what other kinds of uh, mechanisms we should put in place in order to have a revenue stream to be able to continue to build, in to build transit. So, Mr. Speaker, we continue on that path. There's not 
one answer to the question of how do we continue to build transit in the GTHA. It's a complex issue. There are a number of things that we're going to have to do. The green bonds are part of that uh, answer. infrastructure answer, Mr. Speaker, but there is more that we will have to do, and that's why Ann Golden will be giving us her report. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, people want some sense that their government has a plan to confront Ontario's challenges. But when they look at the Liberals at Queen's Park, they see a party throwing everything at the wall in a desperate hope that something will stick. The Premier was clear that her plan was to slap new taxes and tolls on family budgets. Now, she's throwing out different ideas, but can't say what they'll cost, what they'll achieve, or when they might happen. Speaker, can the Premier tell families in Ontario that she won't be hitting them with new unfair taxes, or do they have to wait for the endless panels, conversations and discussions to actually get an answer? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm just going to address the last part of that comment, uh, the question first, which is to say, yes, we do believe in talking to people we about do. decisions. We do believe that getting input on issues is important. I'm sorry that the third party doesn't agree with that, but we do think that it's important to talk to experts and to the people of Ontario about issues before we make policies, Mr. Speaker. In terms of a plan, we have invested $16 billion in transit across this province, Mr. Speaker. We are building transit in the GTHA in particular. The big move is in place, but we have put in place funding for transit in municipalities across the province through the gas tax, Mr. Speaker. So we have a plan. We know that it's very important to implement that plan. We are implementing that plan, and we are working on getting the revenue to make sure that we'll be able to continue yes, implementing sir. it. What we have not seen, Mr. Speaker, is the plan from the third party on how they would build transit or what transit they would build. Thank you. New question. Here the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. I want to turn to another issue where the government seems to be scrambling for some answers. Speaker. People in this province are worried about finding and keeping good jobs. For years, the government championed a policy of no strings attached corporate tax giveaways and insisted that those giveaways would help create 600,000 jobs in this province. Does the Premier think that plan was working? Premier? I didn't even know the question. <laughs> Um, Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. Minister of Economic Development. Well, those changes that we made, and I think the, uh, the uh, leader of the third party is re referring to, uh, among other things, the HST, and of course those predictions are coming true. Uh, job creation since the, uh, the bottom of the recession in June 2009, almost 500,000 jobs have been created. 95% of those jobs, Mr. Speaker, have been full-time jobs, and over 80% of those jobs have been created in the private sector exactly where we want to see them. So we actually are making success in the, precisely the area. We have nearly a million people working in a, in a manufacturing sector in this province, and we're working hard to continue to, to create jobs there. We've got two development funds, regional economic de development funds, that have also helped to create uh, more than 20,000 jobs created and sustained more than 20,000 jobs across this province. So sure. we're meeting with the success uh, as a result of these changes. Supplementary. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Finance spoke vaguely about a plan for targeted tax relief to help companies that are actually ready to make investments in this province. It's exactly the sort of plan that the Liberals have insisted wasn't necessary for years because there are no strings attached. Corporate giveaways were supposedly creating hundreds of thousands of jobs. Is the Premier now admitting that the old plan was a failure, Speaker? Minister. Uh, Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, um, the NDP wants to go back to reckless taxes and uncontrolled spending. That's not what we're doing here, Mr. Speaker. And more importantly, they prefer us not to take those measures that's being used in other parts of the world to promote and support R&D spending. We are looking for ways for our companies to be more innovative, to improve their productivity, to be more competitive, and in Ontario, we'll achieve that by partnering with them and taking the measures necessary to support business in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final well, supplement. Speaker, once again, we see Liberals scrambling and people paying the price. Richard is one of the many young people who wrote us concerning his job prospects, and he's in a pickle, Speaker. He moved to a new town to improve his job prospects and so his fiancée could go to school. But jobs are in such demand that 300 people are showing up 
for temp positions, and he and his fiancée are wondering how they're going to make the bills. Richard and his fiancée don't need empty promises of a vague plan for the future from a scrambling government. They need real plans right now. Will the Premier's fall economic statement include anything for people like Richard or just more warmed-over, vague plans that don't have any details? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, young people in Ontario, people like Richard who are starting off, are looking for opportunities. Opportunities that can only be had if we partner with business, not fight against them. The NDP voted in committee against supporting small business yesterday, Mr. Speaker. That's uncalled for, that's unacceptable, and you partnered with the PCs, no less, to do just that. You have to work together for the benefit of the people of Ontario, not for your political gains, Mr. Speaker. We will support them. We will continue to do what's right, and that includes incentives to promote those jobs and to help people like Richard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, this is a question to the Minister of Health. Minister, yesterday you indicated that you could not intervene in the case of Kim Fletcher because your committee to evaluate drugs determined that Aviston isn't proven to be effective in prolonging survival in those with the, her diagnosis. But that committee's report, which you shared with me yesterday, in point four states, the studies showed that the use of Aviston in patients with GBM was, was associated with higher progression-free survival rates. Minister, how can you continue to duck this issue? Will you now stand in your place and act on what your committee says, that Aviston can help prolong Kim Fletcher's life and others with the same cancer. Why are you failing Question. to take action to save lives of Ontarians? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, this is um, kind of remarkable. If the member would actually read the next paragraph, he would say that uh, um, the committee noted that using historical estimates of survival as the basis of comparison is not reliable because treatment standards have evolved and historical rates are derived from studies that used older, less effective treatments. If the member opposite would tell me what exactly is he recommending? Is he recommending that we move back to the days when ministers, when political people made determinations about what drugs were covered, uh, I would disagree with that. The right thing to do, Speaker, is to let these decisions rest with the experts. If he's recommending that we have one solution for one patient, Order, I reject that as well, Speaker. So my question to the member opposite yes, is, tell me what your policy is on appropriate coverage of drugs. Two supplementary. Minister, I want you to be the Minister of Health. Yes. I think it's shameful that you continue to hide behind the committee to evaluate drugs as if its recommendations were binding pronouncements, when they are not. You would be aware that the committee's recommendations are frequently Order. rejected by executive officers. At no time has any mention made that you, as Minister of Health, cannot have any input Order. into what can only be described as an ambiguous drug evaluation process at best. Minister, helping Kim Fletcher won't save Liberal seats. There's no gas plants involved here. On behalf of Kim Fletcher and others like you, I'm asking you to show some compassion for a brave young woman who only wants to spend Question. as much time with her family as possible. Premier, is this the kind of health minister that you want running Ontario? If she can't provide health care to vulnerable Ontarians, thank you. I, uh, I am uh, going to ask that uh, all members under the circumstances that we find ourselves in, I'm going to ask that all members uh, show some restraint, please. And I would appreciate all members doing that. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Um, speaker, we're talking about a mother. We're talking about a mother with two little children, a little seven-year-old, a little nine-year-old, Speaker. This is a woman 
who has been given a very, very serious and tragic diagnosis. Our health care system every single day does everything it can to support people as they struggle with various health issues. Speaker, I ask the member again, is he asking that we revert to a, to a situation yeah. where political yeah. decisions are made around who gets what drugs, or do we respect the advice we get, not just from our committee to evaluate drugs, but Health Canada, Speaker. Health Canada has, uh, has said there are no data demonstrating an improvement in disease-related symptoms or increased survival Answer. with Avastin in the treatment of GBM. Speaker, this is a tragic story, and I'm asking the member opposite to, not, to take the politics out of this. Thank you. New question. The member from Essex. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Last week, I asked the minister about threats by Cancer Care Ontario to cut all cancer surgery in Windsor due to an escalating dispute regarding thoracic surgery. The minister brushed off my question and refused to intervene or to promise the uninterrupted continuation of these services in our home community. Speaker, Windsor and Essex County residents do not take lightly threats to our health care services, and neither do I. So I ask again, will the minister act immediately to protect cancer services in Windsor and Essex County? Well, Speaker, thank you for the question. And, um, and the member from Windsor West, has, uh, she and I have spoken about this issue on several occasions because she is uh, determined to do everything she can to provide the highest quality care for people in Windsor, Speaker. Uh, Cancer Care Ontario has, uh, has changed how they uh, determine what, uh, what level of hospital should be performing surgery, Speaker, uh, for specific conditions. So uh, in, in this particular case, for this kind of surgery, they've set a threshold of 150 surgeries. The evidence is very clear. Mortality rates have been and cut in half as a result of the quality, as a result of the quality improvement initiatives that Cancer yeah. Care Ontario yes, has put in place, I want every person in this province to have access to the highest quality yeah. care. That does mean sometimes consolidating so that Thank you. deliver the best outcomes. Thank you. Supplementary. That's an unfortunate response, Speaker. Today, Doreen Gravel. A 75-year-old Windsor woman who is both a cancer survivor and a patient is staging a sit-in at Windsor Regional Hospital. She's there today to send a message that care close to home is indispensable for both patients and their families. This brave and ill woman is doing all that she can to protect services for the people in her community. Can the minister tell this House why she has not felt the same obligation as Mrs. Gravel to stand up for Ontario patients? Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, you've heard me say in this House many times that Ontarians have amongst the highest cancer survival rates yeah. anywhere in the world. They will continue, Speaker, to drive even better outcomes for people with cancer. And that does mean Order. sometimes programs are consolidated in order to reduce mortality rates yeah. for patients. It's important to know, Speaker, that cancer services will continue in, in Windsor. They will continue. I have spoken to Cancer Care Ontario about the, uh, the issue around the tone of the letter, and I have been assured, Speaker, that patients in Windsor will continue to receive cancer care. Speaker, one particular procedure, thoracic surgery, will be moved to a centre with higher volumes because it saves lives. Thank you. New question. The member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. My question is uh, for the Minister of Training, College and uh, University, Honorable Brent again. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in the exchange of economic times, uh, and uh, uh, government are especially important and valued. This is particularly true of the Employment Ontario Network. I've heard from some of our local community service providers that they are concerned about losing funding for some of the critical programs they provide to Etobicoke residents. Service providers like Community Microskills Development Centre on Vulcan Street, Street Humber College Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning, and the YMCA of Greater Toronto and Albion Road. 
will all be victimized by funding cuts the federal government is planning to make. Oh. Speaker, can the minister please provide some reassurance to myself as well as members of my community about these critical training organizations that they will not be hurt by the imposed cuts by the Thank Thanks you. Minister of Training College University. Good question. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I wish I could give the member that reassurance, but unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, I can't. Wow. The current federal proposal is to fund their untested, untried Canada Jobs Program by cutting 60 per cent of funding to the Labour Market Agreement, which funds those programs that serve our most vulnerable uh, Ontarians. They're also demanding that the provinces match that funding, which, which represents a combined hit to Ontario's training programs of $232 million. The community groups ought to be concerned about this federal proposal, as should all Canadians. The federal government is asking us to fund their new program at the expense of programs for literacy and basic skills, Aboriginal workers, people with disabilities, youth, newcomers, and older workers. The member can reassure his constituents that this government yes, will not support any program that's funded on the backs of marginalized workers. We will stand up for them and ensure Thank that you. our training programs are available to all Ontarians. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, though I appreciate the ministerial update, I am disappointed to hear that the federal government intends to cut program funding for our most vulnerable workers, regardless of the impact to small business owners. Speaker, perhaps this is another example of a hard right turn that Canada can do without. But I'm pleased that our government is standing up for those Ontarians who need training. As parliamentarians, Speaker, we have an obligation, duty, and responsibility to make sure that no one gets left behind. I've also heard concerns from small and medium-sized businesses within my own riding. The fact is, these organizations are creating the bulk of new jobs in our economy. We want to make sure that any programs proposed to help businesses with worker training are not ignored by the proposed Fed cuts. Speaker, can the minister advise this House what is being done to ensure small and medium-sized businesses that they will not be neglected by the Canada Job Grant proposals? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the member raises a very important point. The yeah. federal government's uh, Canada Job Grant proposal has not been well thought out. The original proposal ignored the needs of small businesses. It failed to recognize that most small businesses would not be able to afford to participate in a program that re required them to invest $5,000 up front uh, in training a new worker. Ontario and the other provinces and territories, as well as our Ontario Chamber of Commerce, have been very vocal on this. While the federal government has indicated that they would provide some greater flexibility in the program to address our concerns, we're of the view that they need to go further and to make this program effective. We need to do everything we can to help small businesses succeed. That includes getting Bill 105 approved and passed by January 1st, so that 60,000 small businesses in Answer. Ontario can get the tax break that they deserve. I urge the opposition parties to cooperate, stop stalling this important bill, and join us in supporting Ontario Thank small you. businesses. Question: The member from Simcoe North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Training, College, and Universities. And I see he hasn't got the job grant right either. Minister, I understand. You are now going to consult with barbers and hairstylists. So my understanding is your enforcement thugs will no longer be harassing barbers for a while. That's good. Now that's amazing because you said they were a self-regulating body, they were standing alone, and you wouldn't be interfering when some messy situation came up like this embarrassment to you with the, with the barbers and the hairdressers. So can you explain why your government didn't consult with tradespeople before you implemented your nanny state college of trades, and by tradespeople, I don't mean Pat Dillon and the Working Families Coalition. I mean the tradespeople in Ontario. You never consulted with them. Why didn't you? Question. Thank you. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, and I can probably see why, but unlike the member opposite, I have a great deal of confidence in my barber. He's been cutting my hair for over 40 years, Mr. Speaker. Nice I think he does a good job. Very nice. 
And I don't only have confidence, Mr. Speaker, as we all do in our barbers, in their ability to do the work that they do, I also have confidence in their judgment. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, like all skilled tradespeople, and barbers are a skilled trade person, that they know better than the member opposite as to what's best for them and how they should be categorized in terms of their trade. Should they be a separate barber trade? Should they be under the stylus, by the way, which is something that the PC party did when they were in office, when they categorized all of the, the barbers, the hairstylists, and the hairdressers together? I dare say, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what kind of consultation was held there. Answer. Probably not a lot. Mr. Speaker, we're reaching out to barbers across this province to let them have a voice in how their trade is going to be governed. I don't know for Thank the you. life of me what the member has against. Thank you. Supplementary. Hey, Mr. Speaker, I know this is humiliating to you. It's an embarrassment, you know, and I feel really, I really feel happy that you like your barber. That's a great thing because my hairdresser and the guy that I get my hair cut from, they don't like you at all. They don't like you at all. So, Minister, Minister, you have, you have to know by now, you have to know by now that the Ontario. set it up that easy. <laughs> All right. Could you please finish your supplementary? Thank you very much. And I know I got nice hair, okay? <laughs> but not as nice as Frank Fraser's hair. But, the, but you have to know, you have to know that the Ontario College of Trades is a complete disaster. At a time when we are trying to create jobs in this province, the Ontario College of Trades is actually driving jobs away. Order. The ratio review is severely flawed, and in fact, your Liberal cabinet has only approved one ratio ah, review to point. Question. Not all the ones you're bragging about each week. Question. This expensive tax is simply not working. Will you agree with Tim Hudak and the PC caucus that the Ontario College of Trades should be abolished once yeah. and for all? Mr. Speaker, I will put my barber, John Spanos in Scarborough, up against the member's hairstylist any time, Mr. Speaker. Let's go ahead. I'll, go to the I'll invite the member out to Scarborough, and Mr. Speaker, if Bellamy and Osmo, he can get himself a great haircut by a barber who's been cutting hair for over 50 years. Wow. Mr. Speaker, the member mentioned... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I could continue with this answer. The member mentioned uh, ratios, Mr. Speaker. Look, our record on ratios, Mr. Speaker, was we, we reduced seven. Mr. Speaker, when the member's party was in office in eight years, they reduced none. The College of Trades has reduced 14 more ratio reductions than all three parties yes, put together over the last 20 years. I'll not only put my barber up against his hairstylist, I'll put our record on reducing ratios up against yeah. his any time. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question. Member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, people who go to work each day in this province deserve fair compensation. Unfortunately, thousands of young people in Ontario work for no pay. They receive no compensation, and they have few rights or protections in their workplace. Despite clear rules regarding unpaid internships, most of these workers are reluctant to speak up and risk being blacklisted by their, their employers. 
The current complaint-based system is unfair and it's ineffective. When will the Liberal government do its job and proactively enforce the law on unpaid internships? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the, uh, the question from the member for Davenport. And it's very important to me that we make sure that, uh, that interns in these situations are fairly treated. I think it's a, it's a very good issue to raise. Um, as far as uh, health and safety for interns, Mr. Speaker, all workers in Ontario should be covered by the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Yeah. We're currently looking at including co-op students working through accredited university and uh, college programs under Ontario's Occupational Health and Safety Act. In terms of uh, the Employment Standards Act, the rules on, on internships are very clear, Mr. Speaker. While most workers in Ontario are covered by the Employment Standards Act, there's a narrow exemption for co-op students, and this exemption is only for accredited university and college programs to give their students a, a valuable opportunity for workplace experience while they're pursuing their degree. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, we Answer. believe that that covers the situation, but as I say, we're acting on uh, including co-op students under health and safety. It's a very important issue. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. You're not covering the situation. Often, uh, the best that most workers in these situations can hope for is a letter of reference uh, that will help them get a paid job in the future. But, Speaker, vulnerable workers should not be forced to choose between their rights at work or a letter of reference. Enforcing the law should be the responsibility of the Ontario government and not the responsibility of vulnerable young workers. This is the issue, this is what's critical here, and the solution is clear. When will this government do the hard work, admit that their complaints-based system does not work for unpaid interns, and start to proactively enforce the law? Thank you, Premier. Well, as I say, Mr. Speaker, there is there's only uh, uh, there's only a an exemption for um, some students who are uh, involved with university and college degrees, Mr. Speaker. Um, if it's the responsibility of the university or the college to ensure that the the placements uh, are fulfilling their mandate, Mr. Speaker. And if if there is uh, if there is a situation where a worker in Ontario feels that their rights are being violated, Mr. Speaker, they can they can and should get in touch with the Ministry of Labour because. We are, we are very clear that th that enforcement should be in place, Mr. Speaker. We are acting on making sure that co-op students are included under the uh, Workplace Safety Act, Mr. Speaker. And as I say, I think it's important that we pursue this issue, that we make sure that there aren't other loopholes, uh, and we will, we will continue to Answer. work with anyone, including the opposition, who wants to uh, ensure that we have those, we have those gaps closed, and we Thank make you. sure that all works in Ontario are safe. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Natural Resources. In Ontario, Speaker, we are fortunate to have a diverse natural landscape with an abundance of biodiversity and wildlife. On October 21st, I was delighted to attend and participate in an announcement in my riding that the minister made in my riding of Vaughan at the Earth Rangers Centre about the Land Stewardship and Habitat Restoration Program. I know that MNR announced this program earlier this year to support local projects across Ontario that help to conserve our province's rich biodiversity. The program provides funding so that community groups can support local land stewardship initiatives and projects that enhance biodiversity and wildlife habit habitats. Speaker, could the minister please explain to the House how this land stewardship and habitat restoration fund is helping to protect the biodiversity of our province? Thank you, Minister Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for the question, and I certainly appreciated the opportunity to make this announcement with him last week in his riding. The residents of Vaughan are certainly fortunate to have a capable representative. As he mentioned, the Land Stewardship and Habitat Restoration Program will provide funding to projects that conserve Ontario's biodiversity. The program builds on our government's ongoing commitment to protect and conserve our biodiversity and maintain healthy and sustainable habitats right across the province. <laughs> Recently, uh, we announced that our ministry will be contributing $300,000 in funding 24 partnership projects focused on land restoration, rehabilitation and enhancement efforts. Together, these projects will help restore more than 1,000 hectares of important habitat right across the province. Protecting the environment will enhance the quality of life for Ontario families and ensure a dynamic economy Answer. for future generations. This project is part of our government's plan to invest in people, infrastructure, and build a strong business climate. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for explaining to the House about this particular, uh, this particular funding. This is indeed a great initiative, and I was excited to hear that a group in my riding, Earth Rangers, received a grant from the ministry. With the support provided by the ministry, the Earth Rangers Foundation will be able to carry out 
Project iRestore, which is an important project that will restore the fields around their headquarters that have been overrun with invasive species. Peter Kendall, Executive Director of Earth Rangers, had this to say. Project iRestore is working to restore what was primarily invasive plant species into native tall grass prairie habitat. Funding from the ministry will ensure we can continue to do this important work and see more biodiversity return to this area. Speaker, could the minister please tell the House about some of the other great projects that will be receiving funding under the LSHRP? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Again, thanks to the member for the question. I certainly appreciate the opportunity uh, to let members know a little bit about the great projects that local residents are working on to protect animals, plants, forests, and wetlands in their own communities right across the province. I want to point out that the 24 projects being funded this year will engage close to 80 partners and leverage an additional minimum $300,000 from other community partners and funding sources, making this truly a community-based initiative. These community groups will bring great value to the projects through their knowledge of local issues, work experience uh, in their communities, and the established relationships that they have with local landowners. The member mentioned Earth Rangers, which is a group carrying out an important project in Vaughan, just one of the many projects. Credit Valley Conservation Foundation will rehabilitate damaged sections of Coldwater Tributary uh, to enhance the existing brook trout population in the Thunder Answer. Bay area. Bright Lake Association will also work with farmers in the Algoma uh, region to help rehabilitate uh, more than 17 types of fish species. This is just one important investment our government is making to help strengthen our biodiversity. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Question of the Premier. You know, Premier, um, 15 uh, years ago, I fought to get slots at the 40 racetrack. I did so because of the track phase closure, and it gave them a 15-year lease on life. It helped to preserve and enhance hundreds of jobs at the 40 racetrack and hundreds more in the broader community. Uh, the Liberal government decided to, um, basically in the, the dark of night, rip out the slot, supported by your NDP who drove away the getaway car. Uh, as a result, that track is spiraling towards closure. I wrote to you a week ago and I said, I have a three-point plan actually to save the Fort Erie racetrack and give some economic stability and opportunity to people who work in that sector. It results in restoring the slots, forming a public-private partnership with an operator who knows how to run the business, and local revenue sharing. You haven't responded to my letter yet. I've asked for me to discuss it. If you want to steal the plan, steal it, but please do something. Will you follow the PC plan and restore the slots Thank and Fort racetrack to save those jobs? Thank you, Premier. No, Mr. Speaker, we won't, because the plan that he has, that the leader of the opposition has acknowledged he fought to put in place, was not accountable. It was not transparent, Mr. Speaker, and it had to be changed. And so we made a decision that we would change it, Mr. Speaker. And at the same time, we have put in place a five-year strategy, a five-year plan with $400 million attached to it that will allow horse racing in this province to be sustainable, including. If the Fort Erie racetrack chooses to, to work with the Ontario Racing Commission and to establish their future, Mr. Speaker, there is absolutely no reason that the Fort Erie racetrack shouldn't be able to have a sustainable future if they work with the ORC. My hope would be that the Leader of the Opposition would work yes, with the folks in Fort Erie, would encourage them to work with the ORC, and put in place a plan that would be transparent and that would focus on the customers and would focus Thank on the you. industry. And I hope he'll work on that, Mr. Speaker. Well, Premier, I am working with the folks in Fort Erie. I was there yesterday. And I'll tell you, they like our plan, and they say that the Liberal NDP plan is going to close down that racetrack. You've got to make a decision. You've got to make it now, because I think you know, as I heard from Ben Vandermeer yesterday when I had his farm, they need to make a decision now about where they're going to race next year. If the track has closed, if it has no future, they'll pick up stakes. They'll lay people off. They'll eliminate jobs. They'll move to the States or elsewhere. That's what's at stake here. Uh, you, in the dark of night, ripped out the slots. You've decided that if a program had a flat tire, if a car had a flat tire, that you would junk it entirely. It was going to cost us tens of thousands of jobs. My colleague from Perth Wellington, Randy Pettipiece, has a plan that will actually give the sector a better future. It actually gives them stability. Make it a world-class jurisdiction. Question. Why are you so hell-bent on closing down the racetrack and rejecting any idea that's going to save the jobs? I'm on the side of jobs. I'm on the side of saving the track. Why aren't you? Please. Please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm on the side of jobs, and I'm on the side of an accountable, sustainable horse racing industry in this province, Mr. Speaker. And I would encourage. I would encourage. Okay. And I would encourage the leader of the opposition to have a conversation with John Snowblen, who has worked very closely with us. He's been part of the panel that has worked with us to put in place a five-year plan that will lead to that sustainable horse racing industry. It's very unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition, for purely political reasons, Mr. Speaker, and we all know what those are, it's transparently political, has stirred the pot in terms of, of encouraging the people at Fort Erie to suggest that they don't have a future. That is just not true. They do if they work with the ORC, they have a future, and he should help them to do that. Yeah, yeah. Question? Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, the Premier wants to cut her way to sustainability. She's cutting jobs in rural Ontario because she thinks the only way to save thoroughbred racing in our province is to thin the field down to one private operator, Woodbine. But she also says the Slots at Race Trucks program had to go because Woodbine used a pile of purse money to stuff the wallets of their executives. The government audited Ontario's race tracks. If the Premier isn't picking winners, why won't she make those audits public? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I've answered this question a number of times, and I think the leader of the third party knows that those audits that were done were done with the understanding that they were confidential in order to work towards a transition plan for the tracks in the province, Mr. Speaker. Now, if the leader of the third party thinks that there shouldn't have been work done to create a uh, third party or to create a uh, transition plan so that we could have a, a plan going forward. Well, that's one thing. But if she thinks that we needed to have a plan going forward, then it only makes sense that we would have worked with the tracks, that we would have had those audits, and the Auditor General is looking at uh, at this situation now, and she will she will release a report. But the fact is that those discussions with those audits with the tracks were done as confidential audits in order to put a transition plan in Answer. place, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Premier likes to brand her government as open and transparent. I guess transparency is only a value when it's convenient for the Premier. She's asking Ontario horse people and track workers to trust her and not to ask too many questions. But people are losing their livelihoods in communities like Fort Erie, and they deserve some answers, Speaker. Before the Premier closes down the Fort Erie racetrack and other tracks across the province, will she pony up the results of government? audits so we can see just how much horse money went to executive compensation and perks at Woodbine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I know that the leader of the uh, third party will read the Auditor General's report when, it, uh, when it's released. But, Mr. Speaker, it is, um, it's it's very interesting that the leader of the third party seems so interested in the, the health and stability of the horse racing industry, and yet, Mr. Speaker, did not support the appointment of a former NDP agriculture minister to be to lead the Ontario Racing Commission, Mr. Speaker. It is beyond understanding why they would not have supported that appointment of Elmer Buchanan, given, Mr. Speaker, that he has such a deep knowledge of the sector and that he has worked on putting a sustainability plan in place. It says to me, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party is actually Answer. not interested in a sustainable plan, but is actually more interested in political gain on this, Shame. which I think is shameful because we want a sustainable Thank industry. You. Here, That's here. why we've worked with the Thank panel. That's right. New question. Member from Scarborough Rouge River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. This past Thursday, second reading on my private member's bill carried. Bill 116, the Manoranjana Kanasaba Pati Act, was introduced to address the number of drivers who disregard the law and still continue to use a handheld device while driving, despite the fact that it is illegal. My bill will increase the fines for distracted driving and assign three demerit points to offenders. Speaker, distracted driving is responsible for causing more than 20 per cent of vehicle road accidents in Ontario. As legislators, it is our responsibility to review the current law regarding distracted drivers and strengthen them to ensure that the fines and penalties in place deter drivers from using any handheld device while driving. 
Mr. Speaker, I know the government has a lengthy history of taking action on making our roads safer. Can the minister tell us about these steps and also if he supports the initiative in my bill? Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, my colleague and my friend from uh, Scarborough Rouge River for his very solid leadership on this issue, Mr. Speaker. Great leadership. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, I just came from uh, spending the morning with Chief Blair and the volunteers of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, who's a really remarkable leader with incredible integrity. Great leader. And you know, the the success of our drunk driving laws, Mr. Speaker, have brought. Uh, Fatalities down to where we're almost 50 percent less than the Canadian average, and they have dropped from 227 deaths to 160. But distracted driving losses have gone up by 65. That's 65 families, Mr. Speaker, who have lost a, a father, a mom, a child, and that's devastating, Mr. Sir. Speaker. We need to look to the success of things like drunk driving and apply those lessons uh, to distracted driving, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to hear that our government is taking the problem of distracted driving seriously. Initiatives taken by our government has made our roads safer, much more than many other jurisdictions in North America. But we all know that there's more that can be done. There have been too many innocent lives lost because someone else feels that their text message or phone call is more important than focusing on the road. It is also reassuring that the minister supports my bill and that he identified that it is important to take action now on making our roads safer and penalize those who break the law. But, Speaker, we need to take action on this issue now. Speaker, can the minister tell Question. us what are some of the measures that his ministry is working on and what new action can we expect from his government? Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to commend the member on his private member's bill. This is really an excellent step forward. And, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's great that we have young people in the audience today because they are often uh, the victims of distracted driving and drunk driving. Um, and I was just with several moms who have lost that. One of the things they raised with me was, we've done it on drunk driving, now we've got to do it on distracted driving, Mr. Speaker. And that's a mixture. I know the Canadian Auto Association is here. I want to thank and recognize them in the gallery, Mr. Speaker, uh, because they are running some of the best education programs on distracted and drunk driving. Uh, we need to increase both our regulations and penalties, and we're reviewing the law right now, Mr. Speaker. I know there's members opposite to, as well from Nepean and Carl Carlton and, uh, and other constituencies that have yes, also sir. been supportive of this. So we will be bringing forward uh, an action plan considering legislation and regulations as well as education in the very near future. Mr. Thank, Mr. You. Thank you. Tim, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, my question is to the Minister of the Environment today. Now, Minister, I've repeatedly asked you in this House if you're going to pay back the money that the Liberal government stole from Ontario drivers using the drive. Withdraw, please. With withdraw. <laughs> Took from Ontario drivers using a drive clean program. And every time you avoid my question saying, well, you'll potentially stop stealing money or taking money, rather. I know what I'm doing. Withdraw. Withdraw, withdraw. Ask the question. Stop taking money in a few months from now. Minister, that's not good enough. The Supreme Court ruled that profits made off of revenue neutral programs are illegal and they must be paid back. That means you owe Ontario drivers question. $19 million. So, Minister, back. will you commit today to repay the money you back. illegally took from Ontario drivers or will. I'm. Uh, stop the clock, please. I'm loath, I'm loath to miss uh, any question, but if the member wants to go down that road, I have warned him to make sure that he's perfectly clear. If he goes down that road, I will pass the question. Finish the question. You've got 10 seconds. We agree to pay back Ontario monies today. We'll take a lawsuit filed in court to get the money back. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the, the Minister of Finance has already indicated that the program will be made revenue neutral. You will know that it was, of course, in deficit for the first, uh, at least first decade. But you know, it's interesting that you ask this question on the day when all of us are wearing a, a, a pin 
which deals with those who suffer from lung cancer. Exactly. Because the Ontario Lung Association says that uh, there are problems. They release pollutants, come to cause breathing, breathing difficulties, irritated eyes, coughing, and headaches. They trigger asthma attacks, worsen symptoms in people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and contribute to other serious health problems, including heart disease and yes, cancer. Sir. This is a program which the Ontario Lung Association and the medical community indicate tremendous Thank support you. for. It's one that saves lives. Thank you. Supplementary. Cash Again to the minister. Minister, your answers prove you will stop at nothing to defend this temporary program, which the vast majority of Ontarians oppose. And now even the Toronto Star. Yeah, you heard that right. The Toronto Star has adopted our position to scrap drive clean. So clearly, you're on the wrong side of this issue. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Minister, but Minister, let's listen. Read them up there. Minister, there's time to save face here. You can do that today by committing to Ontarians that you will meet the demands of the Ontario PC Party and our leader, Tim Hudak, which we have made more than two years ago to get rid of drive clean. So, Minister, will you back down from your unreasonable defense of this useless program today and commit to scrapping drive clean? You're here. Thank you. Minister? Well, well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, I, uh, I must call into question. Here we have history in this legislature. We have a member of the Conservative Party quoting what you usually refer to as the Red Star. I simply can't believe that you would be doing so. But let me quote someone who's very credible on this issue. Gord Miller, Environmental Commissioner Miller, of Ontario. The you Drive Clean program has undergone a number of independent program reviews that concluded significant reductions in smog-causing pollutants were being achieved, but that further reductions could result from program improvements, including the implementation of onboard diagnostic emissions testing, which is currently underway. That's the highly uh, reputable and uh, one who has been supported by all in the legislature, Gord Miller, Environmental Commissioner, the Thank province you. of Ontario. Thank you. New question. Member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government has been sitting on a fall prevention safety strategy since 2010. It is now 2013, and still we are hearing from this government that consultation is ongoing and something will be coming soon. In Newfoundland and Labrador, the provincial government reviewed its health and safety regulations in 2009. The result by 2012 falls from heights were reduced 25 per cent. There are nearly 3,500 serious falls on the job each year in Ontario. A 25 per cent reduction would mean 800 fewer serious workplace falls. I ask the Premier, when does this government expect the Heights Training Regulation to come into force? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, um, I, I'm very glad that the uh, member opposite has asked this question, and I know that the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities actually has some, uh, some information. But what I will say, Mr. Speaker, is that we, uh, we want very much to make sure that, uh, that this program is in place. We think it's very important that we do everything we can. Um, it's absolutely consistent with, uh, with prevention of, uh, of illness, prevention of injury that uh, we know is in the best interest, obviously, of individuals, but is also in the best interest of workplaces. and. Uh, of the health care system. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that the uh, member opposite has asked this question. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, to the Premier, last week this House heard that nine workers have fallen and died on construction sites across Ontario since June of this year. And yet your Minister of Labour cannot tell us when a training standard to prevent falling on job sites that was drafted and endorsed by the former Minister of Labour three years ago will be in place. Last week I spoke to Tom Began, the former Chief Provincial Officer for the Province of Ontario. His opinion on the matter, there's no reason for this standard not to be in place today. When will this government do what it claims as its number one priority, enact the fall prevention regulation and put worker safety first? Mr. Chairman, calls universities. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the Minister of Labour would be able to provide more specifics to the member, but I know the Minister of Labour and his ministry have been working very hard when it comes to false prevention. In fact, I think just recently uh, they've been out in workplaces right across the province on an action plan 
uh, to, to reduce falls and, and to be out there and really try to, to enforce it uh, in, in a way that really has been effective. Uh, but, Mr. Speaker, uh, any tragedy in the workplace is one tragedy too many. It's something we take very seriously. It's a reason, Mr. Speaker, we've brought forward many preventative measures that have helped reduce workplace, in, 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 workplace injuries uh, at, a, at a level that's far, far lower than was when we took office. It's something that's incredibly Answer. important to us. I thank the member for raising the issue. It's a very important issue, and I know that the Minister of uh, Labour is on it. Member from Davenport on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd just like to, uh, to take a moment to welcome Food Pioneer and Executive Director of Food Share, Debbie Fields, to the Legislature. Welcome. The, uh, in the Members West Gallery, we have someone who has represented Beaches Woodbine in the 35th and 36th Parliament and Beaches East York on the 37th Parliament, Madam Frances Lankin. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 36, an act to enact the lack of Local Food Act 2013 and to amend the Taxation Act 2007 to provide for a tax credit to farmers for donating certain agricultural products that they have produced. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members take their seats, please? All members take their seats, please. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion. On November the 4th, Mr. McMeekin moved third reading of Bill 36. All those in favour, rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk, please. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Malloy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Garretson. Mr. Jeffrey. Mr. Jeffrey. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Sandal. Ms. Sandal. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Bartolucci. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mrs. Cansfield. Mrs. Cansfield. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. Peruzza. Mr. Peruzza. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. McNeely. Mr. McNeely. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mrs. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Cleese. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Chudley. Mr. Clark. Clark. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. O'Toole. Mr. Willett. Mr. Willett. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mrs. McKenna. Mrs. McKenna. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Leone. Mr. Leone. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Milligan. Mr. Milligan. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Genovo. Mr. Genovo. Mr. Marchese. Mr. Marchese. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Mr. Prue. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Shine. Mr. Shine. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 101, the nays are zero. Yeah. The ayes being 101 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill will now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.